Okay, now let's come back to something we said before, which is that we expect all the magnetic field lines to form loops. Well, now we can draw that loop. Ah, well, it's supposed to be a circle. If I had been doing things to scale, this would be a circle over here. Uh, now we can understand what all these are showing us. At the top of the circle, the field is just pointing horizontally to the left. Over here, it's pointing vertically down. Over here, it's pointing horizontally to the right. Over here, it's pointing vertically up. And here, when we're kind of um, at a 45 degree angle, well, the vector is also kind of at a 45 degree angle. That picture didn't come out very pretty. But if I could draw a better circle. The magnetic field at different points would look like this. So now you can see how you can use your finger pads to trace out the entire circle by rotating it around your thumb. Um, if you keep your thumb pointing in the same direction, you can see here how our finger pads show that the magnetic field lines are tracing out what a counterclockwise loop. Mm -hmm. You can see how we figure out the counterclockwise loop. On some problems, you're only going to care about the magnetic field at one point, so you won't bother drawing the loop. But you should always know in the back of your mind, even if you've only drawn one point, it's really part of a whole loop. And we can see how you can use the finger pads to draw that whole loop. Okay. All right. Again, um, you can see why some teachers like to use a curling fingers right hand rule, because it allows them to kind of curl around the loop. But I just haven't had much luck with students working on that. So I think it's better just to keep your fingers straight and just have the direction of your finger pads show the direction of the loop. That way, both of the right hand rules we've learned have involved keeping your fingers straight. But you've got to remember this right hand rule focuses on which way your fingertips are pointing, and this one focuses on which way your finger pads are pointing. All right, very good. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. figure out the direction of the magnetic field over here. Okay. Um, so your thumb is pointing up. Mm -hmm. Your fingers are pointing to the left. Our fingers should be to the left of our thumb, because we're focusing on a point that's to the left of our thumb. And now our pads are coming out of the fork. What would be the symbol for that? A dot. Very good. So what would be the direction of the magnetic field over here? Um, yeah, it would also be coming out of the board. Good. How about, let's figure out the direction of the magnetic field over here. Okay, so thumb pointing up, fingers pointing to the right. Fingers positioned to the right of the thumb, good. And now finger pads are going into the board. Right, so the symbol would be? The X. Right. Now remember that these have to be part of a loop. Where is the loop? Yeah, these are the only point, points that are easy to draw. The rest of the loop is coming into the, into the page and out of the page. Mm -hmm. Because the current here is in the plane of the page, the rest of the loop is hard to draw. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we can maybe uh, use some three-dimensional visualization. We can say this is the rest of the loop. So you need to imagine that this line represents a portion of the loop that's actually closer to you than the wire. Mm -hmm. And this portion represents the part of the loop that is behind the wire. And now we can also use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the magnetic field over here. Okay. This um, is the point on the loop that is uh, closest to you. Oh, okay. Um, so I is pointing up. Your fingers are, I guess, like this? Yeah, this represents a, a, a point that is in front of the board. Mm -hmm. So I need to put my fingers in front of my thumb. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and then it's my finger pads are pointing to the right, so. So the direction of the magnetic field here is to the right. Mm -hmm. All right, and let's figure out the direction of the magnetic field at this point, which is the point in the loop that's furthest away from you. Um, okay, so up, and then fingers pointing into the board. We want the fingers to be behind the thumb. Good. And now finger pads are to the left. Right. Now these two. Now, if you think about it, we only had to figure out one of these, because all of the vectors have to be consistent with each other. Just, as soon as we got this arrow, we knew that the direction of the magnetic field was always in this direction. You can see how all these arrows are consistent with each other. Mm 
right, coming out of the board to the right, going into going back into the board. So technically speaking, you only have to use your right hand rule once for any loop, uh, but it's good to double check just to make sure that all the different arrows are consistent. Now, for in practical terms, usually on this type of problem, we're only going to focus on the points that are in the plane of the page. But that should not make us forget that there actually is an entire loop that's pointing out of the page and into the page as well. Okay. Good. Okay, well, that is the right hand rule for figuring out the direction of the magnetic field from a source current. How would you have known on this problem that we're treating this as a source current and not a test current? Um, because, I mean, I guess because, first of all, there's no force anywhere. That's right. Well, are we looking at the field that's coming from this current, or are we focusing on the force that's being exerted on the current? The field coming from yeah. the current. Yeah, that's how we know we're treating this like a source current. Mm -hmm. Because we were asking about the field that's coming from this source current. We weren't asking for the force on this current. Yeah. The reason I'm emphasizing this is one of the biggest mistakes people make is they use these right-hand rules when they should use these right-hand rules, or they use these right-hand rules when they should use these. So the very first thing you've got to do is ask, am I focusing on this as a source current or as a test current? Well, if you're focusing on a field that's coming from the current, you're treating it like a source current. Mm -hmm. But if you're focusing on a force on the wire, you're treating it like a test current. Unfortunately, in the textbook, they don't usually write IS and I not. So people don't know when to use one set of rules and when to use the other. But in your work for a beginner, I would recommend always specifying, am I doing an I not problem or an IS problem? So we know which right hand rule to use. Okay. If you think about it, remember when we first started today, I was asking you how to find the direction of the electric field from the source charge. And you mistakenly told me how to figure out the direction of the force from the field. Well, that's that same type of mistake. We always have to ask, are we focusing on something as a source charge or as a test charge? So we know which part of the handout to use. By the way, again, um, confusingly, if you wanted to, uh, maybe I shouldn't even go into that here. Yeah, um, there's a way that you could use your fingers to represent the current and your thumb to represent the field. Uh, but it, you, we only need one thing, so let's just use the thumb for the current and the fingers for the field. Okay. Well, um, what do we have left to do? Well, the last task we have to do is we have to figure out how to figure out the magnitude of the magnetic field from a source charge. And again, we're only going to focus on the magnetic uh, field that comes from currents. In an introductory class, we're not going to focus on individual charges for this part of the flowchart. Um, if you remember for electric field, we had Gauss's law. For electric field, we had Gauss's law. This was a general way to figure out the electric field. We drew that uh, Gaussian surface um, where the electric field would be uniform so we could take it out of the integral and then we could solve this equation for E. Um, and we saw that we could use this to prove a bunch of shortcut formulas. For example, if you have spherical symmetry, when you're outside of distribution with spherical symmetry, Gauss's law could be used to prove this formula. And we could also prove a formula for when you um, have an infinite line distribution, or for when you have an infinite plane. And those all came from Gauss's law. Uh, but I think, for the most part, for your introductory course, in many cases, you'll be, able, you'll be allowed just to use the shortcut formulas without having to prove them from Gauss's law. Although we actually did a bu bunch of examples of how to use Gauss's law to prove things. Well, it's the same deal here. Here, again, there is a general um, law based on an integral that you can use to find the magnetic field. And there's also a bunch of shortcut formulas. And because this is an introductory class, I think your class is mainly going to focus on the shortcuts. Um, so the general formula is called Ampere's Law.
right, so here we have Ampere's law. This is in your handout. This is kind of like Gauss's law. It plays a similar role to Gauss's law for electric field. This is a way that we could figure out um, magnetic fields. Mu zero is a constant that plays a similar role to epsilon zero. This is what we call the permittivity constant. This is called the permeability constant. And in the handout, I mentioned that it's 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7. So you'll probably have to look that up during the test. This is 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7 newtons per amp squared. Um, so this plays a similar role for magnetism that epsilon zero plays for electric field. 